Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and welcome to I Am Loved Church. Wow, I don't know if you can tell, but it's snowing and it's a Sunday, 2019. First time I've seen snow this year, I believe, unless it was when we came out of last year. Very interesting. And this morning, actually, at the, um, what was it called? Lion Fred Baldini Park. I'm supposed to be preaching as well. So thanks, Lord. (laughs) That's okay. Anyways, um, what is the message today? The message is, read the Bible. The message is, love each other. Look at the Bible, hopefully, as I look at it, in most contexts, literally, Jesus, God is commanding us to live this way. As Paul states, even in Old, not Old Testament, but in New Testament, he wants us to live a holy and blameless life. He wants us to not serve our masters uh, wherever you work as you serve each other, <clears throat> because when they're not looking, you're not probably going to do the right thing. But he wants us to serve reverently, as if we're serving God himself. He wants us to love each other reverently as if we're loving Jesus himself and respect each other as if we're respecting the Lord himself. Here's one of my ones I've always wanted to preach on, but I just never got around to it. And the verse goes something like this. It's in the Gospels or the parable, which is in the Gospels. To the least of these you've done, you've done to me. And basically, it's a sayings and riddles, basically Jesus saying, if you've treated anyone wrong, you've treated me wrong. If you've lusted after anyone, stolen anything that's a sin, you've done it to me. If you've done anything good, you've done it to me. So it's this idea of, wow, that's perfection, right? And he says, I will pay you back in full. Dang. He says, what you sow is what you reap. You may not sow it exactly. You may not get it back exactly the way you sowed it, but you will get it back. And he says, anyone who keeps watch for the Lord's coming, I will come in an hour that you don't know. Dang, that's intense. Who could live like this? Certainly not us, especially with our baggage and our past. But thank God for his mercy and his forgiveness and most importantly, his Holy Spirit. They all, they're all wrapped up in one thing. But um, that's what's amazing about his grace is though you were a sinner, though you still are going to sin, he allows you He doesn't punish you for the things that you don't know. He punishes you for the things that you do know. So the non-believers, they're being punished in a way that um, everyone's being punished, whether they know the law or whether they don't. But God shows grace to everyone. Everyone has grace, some form of grace. The fact you woke up today is God's grace. Even if you're a non-believer, the fact that you can, your brain works and everything and you can feel, touch, taste, sense, you're still here. God still is giving you a chance to repent and come to him and to surrender your life to him. That's his grace. Because once you die, it's all over. You either are in heaven or you're not, which is you already know. So, and we will be judged by everything that we do here on earth. I don't believe personally that you'll be judged for the things that you repented for. I believe you'll be judged for the things that you didn't and you'll be judged by all your deeds, everything you've done. I I don't, because he says, 
as far as the east is from the west is, is as far as I've cast my cast your sins away. So I believe it's very important to repent every day because we're constantly sinning every day and to constantly be in the word of God to know what pleases the Lord and what doesn't please the Lord. Because it's easy to please each other because we don't see each other all the time. And plus, what one may think is right, which is actually wrong. So it's important not to follow each other, but to follow the Holy Spirit and where he wants us to go and what he wants us to do and to do it. I didn't know this, but, you know, not something that I wanted to pay attention to, but the Lord revealed to me something interesting. It was profound. It was like I thought something negative and I felt conviction from the spirit saying, you need to repent. You need to not think that way. And I was like, oh, my gosh, he's paying attention to your thoughts. Everything that you think will be held at judgment day. Everything. That's intense. That's perfection. Man, I mean, we judge each other by the mere appearances of things. You have a big house. You have a big, you have nice cars. You have children. You're living good life pretty good. But God looks at the heart and he looks at what are you, what people don't see all the time. What do you do when people don't see you? What are you thinking all the time? And that's pretty intense if you ask me I mean all the time everything I think everything that people when people don't see me God is watching me I mean if that's not fear then I don't know what is because that's the kind of that's a healthy fear he wants you to fear him not man he wants you to actually love people not say you love them not pretend that you love people he actually wants you to love them he actually wants you to forgive them like and it actually if someone if you forgive someone you don't you don't not just talk about what they've done to you <clears throat> you don't even remember it cuz he says love remembers no wrongs so if you remember sin it's because you haven't really forgiven that person if you remember your own sin it's because you haven't really been forgiven by god because as far as the east is from the West, which he's basically saying eternity, is as far as I've cast your sins away. So there needs to be some deep worship, deep prayer, deep seeking God to get that sin healed. Because the fact that you remember that means you're still in your sins. And Jesus says, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Meaning I will not forgive you because you will not seek my face. And he says in Psalms and basically throughout the whole Bible, he says the proud don't seek God. And they're perishing every day for they live for the boastfulness of their heart's desires. Basically he's saying they consume this world, but they don't even pay attention to death. They don't even think about death. <clears throat> that's scary. I mean, we could die any day, in any moment, at any time. And he says, the proud, they don't not only seek my face, whom is God, they don't even think about the day they're going to die. There's a parable that goes in the New Testament where Jesus says, um, there was a man who laid up treasures for himself. <clears throat> And when he basically retired, he says, now I will eat, drink and be merry for the rest of my life. And God comes to him and he says, you fool, you've laid up treasures here on earth. And today I desire your soul. Don't lay treasures up in this world. Follow the Holy Spirit and do what you're called to do. You're called to bring people to Christ because this world is passing away along with its desires. There's a new desire every day new cars, new fashions and clothings and everything is new every day and it's dying and people are dying every day. So the important thing is to the least of these you've done, you've done to me. Every time I think of something negative, even if it's against a person or myself, I pray against that. He says, hold every thought captive and bring it into the obedience of Christ. For the imagination of man is evil and vain and proud. Every time I think of something that doesn't, the Holy Spirit tells me, repent, 
pray, even for my enemies, even for the people that I want to freaking murder. He says, pray for them. That's hard. But the Holy Spirit has given us power to humble ourselves. Now, listen to this. Power isn't in authority. Authority is in humility and humility is where true power is. And that is where the Lord wants to meet us. And that is where the Lord lives. You have to pray for your enemies, literally. Oh, I pray for them. I pray, Father, not not a vain prayer, but an actual genuine prayer that you want to see healing in their life. I have people disrespecting me all day. And God says, the grace that I've given you to undergo this, to take the beatings that they're giving you with their lips, their looks, their eyes, I've given you this grace so you can love them, so you can show who I am to, my, to the people that don't know me. Because realistically, when Jesus died on the cross, he says, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. They don't know what they do. <clears throat> when Adam ate that fruit, psh, the imagination went off. The fact that you are a reason and you like to reason everything shows that you're in sin. You're in sin because you're not stable. Your thoughts are all over the place like a wild bush. But Jesus wants to come in and clean that bush. He wants to prune off all the bad things and he wants to make that, uh, that tree that you are fruitful don't believe everything that you hear and everything that you see. Easier said than done. And don't listen to everything because not everything is good for you. <clears throat> or don't focus on the negative things. He constantly says, seek my face. Above all else, seek Jesus. Seek him in everything and everything you do. For the wise people, here's an interesting thing, and I know some of you have heard it. The wise men, when Jesus, when they saw the star of Bethlehem, uh, where the Messiah was going to be born, the wise men sought Jesus. Wise men still seek Jesus. Seek Jesus every day. Every day. Lay your life down. Don't look for the things in this world or your desires because the heart is evil. Seek Jesus in all that you do and everything that you think. Know that God is watching you. He's watching you not only in your physical all the time. He's watching you in your spiritual. What are you thinking? <clears throat> Everything. God wants an intimate relationship with you, and he wants you to live very fruitful and very healthy, not just in this world, because he will provide for the physical, but he first is more, is more worried about your spiritual body. He's worried about your mind. He's worried about your heart. He's worried about Everything that you go through, your soul, that's the salvation, your soul. I remember I found myself in many bars drinking, thinking that was going to fill me up. No, it filled up my tummy and it made me vomit a lot. Not every night, but you get the idea. But the point is, I thought it was going to satisfy my soul. And I saw many things in this world thinking that they're going to satisfy. Maybe if I buy a brand new this, maybe if I get this, maybe if I get a lot of people to like me, maybe if I do this, maybe if I do that. And none of them, if anything, they, they left me drained and tired and exhausted. And I would do these things and no one would appreciate me. But I tell you, if you seek God, he says, those who seek me and they know they're poor. The poor seek Jesus every day through his word. Do you want to have a relationship through a third party or a fourth party or fifth party? Basically like five people down the line and then you talk to five people about this one person. What is that one person like? And it's like that game telephone where they whisper in each other's ears. There's a big circle. By the time it gets around, they finally tell it. They, uh, the message is relayed, but the message has changed. Jesus doesn't want that relationship with you. It's not that those things aren't true, some of those things that people tell you about God, but Jesus wants a personal relationship with you. He wants you to have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with him. And one of the ways we can do that is by reading the Bible. I consider it like being a Wi-Fi signal, such as when you're trying to tune into a Wi-Fi signal, you have to go and you have to find the, the, um, the address bar 
And if you don't know what address bar it is, you're going to get a bunch of other places to tune into. And that's why we don't have a good life because we're tuning into the wrong address bar. It's, yes, it's great to have pastors. Pastors are great. They're out they're, they're, they're there to relay information um, to, to his people. Because, um, you know, realistically, God can just show up and appear. But the thing about this creator is he loves to use us because we're his children. You know, I like to see my my child do the right thing. It's amazing me and it grieves me when I see my children doing the wrong thing. <clears throat> but I want them to do it within their own free will that I've given them. I don't want to force them to do it all the time. I want to just see it when they just do it. I saw my daughter just cleaning on her own. It was just amazing. I was like, it was just the greatest thing I've ever seen, pretty much. So that's how God is with us. He wants to, to do it, not because, yes, he tells us to, but because we want to, not because we have to. And some of us ministers, we think that we have to do things because we were put in this position when that's not the truth. Jesus doesn't want you to have a burden. He doesn't want you to have any burden. And the fact that you're treating ministry like a burden shows that you're falling away from Christ because everything that God gives us is free. I remember this amazing moment this week where Jesus just anointed me like crazy with just grace, just pouring out, just wow, I felt I was going to melt on the spot and just start crying. <clears throat> and I'm just trying to keep it together, keep it together, keep it together, you know? And suddenly this person comes through the line and they start being really rude. Let's just say that much. I don't even remember who it was or what happened. I just remember there was something like that that happened because of the anointing. That's what I do remember, the good. Remember the good. Cling to it. Hold to it. So this person comes through the line, and they're just being rude, terrible. And I'm just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I'm just like going back to my old habits, my human nature. I'm just like, I'm just not going to pay attention to this person. I'm putting my head down. I'm just going to completely ignore this person and let them pass through the line. Now, in human, as humans, that's very reasonable. But in God's servant, that's not how he wants it to be. At least Maybe certain situations, I don't know every situation, but at least in this situation, he didn't want me to do it. And this is what he told me in this moment, as this is happening right before I was going to do this, because I've done it before. He said, Jeremy, my grace. <clears throat> it's not for you. It's I give you grace not so you can hold on to it, but so you can give it away. And maybe God is saying the same thing to you. I've given you what you have in your life, not so you can hold on to it, so, but so that you can bless someone. And that's what he says, my grace is sufficient in this moment. In your moment of trouble or trial, my grace is sufficient. It's enough. It's exactly what you need. You have right now, as you will always have from the day that you die, everything that you need. The thing is, are you going to use it? God gives us exactly what we need when we need it. So all that grace wasn't just for me to just, just relax in it. All that grace was meant for me to give it, to serve it to this person who had no grace in their life. And somehow I was able to do that. I was able to look at my enemy in the face. Not this person was an enemy at the time, but I've even had encounters where people that I wouldn't get along with came through and um, I spoke with and he anointed me again. And, I looked them dead in the face and I said, how are you doing today? 
This is the person that I had strife with. And I was like, wow. That's power. That's the power of God. Because I couldn't do that myself. I would just bicker and complain and hate this person for the rest of my life. But God so loved me. That's how he treated me. He loved me enough to show me grace, even when I was his enemy. And that's how he feels about you. To the least of these you've done, all the negative. You're treating God <clears throat> bad by treating your neighbor badly. But he's saying, I still love you besides all this. I don't even pay attention to that. And it's amazing. It's, I see a lot of things in this world that I do not like. Like I do not like, it actually grosses me out it's in, in some ways. But then that grace comes in. And for some reason, as I'm focusing on all the negative things that I dislike about this person or these people or the situation or whatever, my mind starts to change. My heart starts to f change as well and melt. Not, the f not for the idea of I'm better or whatever, you know, it was just the idea of looking through those sins, looking past people's um, failures or the things that you don't like in seeing a child of God. I, I, I couldn't, I can't explain to you this grace. I, you, can, you can see past people's flaws and you can see how God sees people. And that comes from his anointing. That comes from those who actually believe in Jesus, who actually read the Bible and that's why he says, be cautious of the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they teach you to pay attention to every little thing and judge people by every little thing that they do. But the grace of God and the Holy Bible stand over here and they stand apart and they say, it's grace. I see through your mistakes. I see through the flaws and the things that I don't like. And all I see is a child of God made in his image. And all I see is love love and it's just amazing it's grace but the pharisees are basically people who th they kind of think too much they kind of try to make sense of everything you know why do you do this why do I? and it's not for good you definitely can tell it's it's just they don't know how to have a relationship everything to them and their thinking is a competition competition they can't have a normal conversation just to enjoy one another's company it's all about overcoming the next the other person's you know topping them they're one uppers you know oh you drive this oh well i drive that oh you did this well i did this that's not jesus and it's not the god that i serve and the fact that church is turned into this way i'm so sorry i'm so sorry because church should not be this way because we're all invited into the lord's supper not by anything that we did except acknowledge that we needed a savior. And that's what he gives us. He says, everyone who thinks that they, they, have, they are smart and that they are worthy, they are outside of heaven. They're outside my supper. They're outside my, my, <clears throat> my will. They're cast into the fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that doesn't just mean after this life, that means right now. You see people cast out. They are angry, right? That means the Holy Spirit is not over their life. They're striving after one another. They're bitter. Their jokes are foul. Everything that they do is completely bad. Don't get me wrong. People who are saved are bad just as much. But we know we're bad. We're not in denial that we're bad. We actually know that we're bad. We know that we're evil. We know we need a savior and we repent for our sins. And that's, that's the punctuation to this sermon. Repent. Every day, repent. You need to repent to something every day. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's a promise. And that's what the word says. Repent every day. Repent. <clears throat> repent to the day you die because you're always sinning in, some, in, in, in God's eyes in some way or manner. And he will reveal to you what you've done. 
as long as we're in this body, we're going to continue to sin. But his grace through time will start to mold you into Christ. So everyone needs to repent of something, whether they need to give forgiveness or, or receive it. You need to repent. Even for your thoughts. It's getting cold out here. <laughs> so my hands are anyways. <clears throat> we all have to repent. We all are sinning on a daily basis. We all fall short every day. And that's what's amazing. Jesus did it all. He punched us right in our pride. Boom. Because that's all humans try to do. They try to earn everything. We try to earn everything. Look at me. Look what I did. All by myself. Look at all the, you know, <clears throat> sports. Look at them. Look at their face. Look at the way they are. They're just like, yeah, me, you know. And that's the hardest thing. And my walk with Jesus... <clears throat> I try to memorize scripture. I try to read through it. I go to school. I try to do all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Look at me. Look at me. Look at all my degrees and this and this and this and this and that. Look at this. You want to see the degrees that I got? Look at that. <laughs> Anyways, the point is this. We try to get something and do something to show that we're better than someone, anyone. And Jesus is basically saying, stop living your life in competition to one another and start living your life for each other and for him stop being so conditional some people y'all only have relationships because you guys compete against each other there's nothing wrong with friendly competition but when you start to strife over who's better because of whatever that's worldly stuff Jesus just wants you guys to be friends. I remember I compete with my friends all day. We play chess, checkers, you know, the fun games, you know, video games. Oh, I'm going to crush you. Da, da, da. That's just fun. But when you start to use that <clears throat> as like, he's just mad and I'm not hanging out with him or her because I beat them at this game or because I'm more prettier than them. Come on, man. That sounds like you sound like a little kid. Because at the end of the day, you guys should just, he wants you, his children to get along. How, how my heart melts when I my children get along. When I see my daughter just playing with Lily, Joy playing with Lily, and she's just so nice and just like, oh, yeah, I want to help you and stuff. That's awesome. I don't want to see them. I don't want to see them wearing, never mind, let me not get into that. But um, I don't want to see them bickering and fighting. You know, if they're just doing it competitively and having fun, sure. But I don't want their bond to break just because something dumb. And that's the way some of you guys in church have turned into. You compete against who's more holy and who's more righteous and you forget the truth. Jesus died for your sin. You can never pay him back. You couldn't do that even if you wanted to. Because I know that for me to wake up and go to work every day and deal with the things that I got to deal with or to get out of this house, that's the power of God. But he says his grace is sufficient. His grace will strengthen you. His grace will give you the wisdom that you need when you need it and the knowledge you need when you need it. It's all grace and it's undeserving. This is what grace is. Cop pulls you over. He could take you to jail or he can give you a ticket. But he decides to do none. And he says, you're not free to go because you're good. You're free to go because I'm kind. <clears throat> and that's what God offers you. But he says, you have to repent first. You have to acknowledge you're wrong. Every day, every day, I'm wrong, God is right. I'm wrong, Jesus is right. I'm wrong, I have to follow the Holy Spirit. Anytime you think you're wrong, right, other than knowing that the only the Lord is right, you're boasting. You're boasting in your own strength. And some of you guys are so deceived. I know it because I fell into it. I can only speak about the things that I know. God knows how evil the heart is. It's so evil. I tell you, I tell you the truth. It's so evil. We can even boast in Jesus as if, we, as if, we're, as if we're the only ones with this knowledge. 
or we're the only ones deserving of it. Like, oh, yeah, God let me figure it out, but he didn't let nobody else figure it out. It's pride. Because when you boast in the Lord, it should just simply be, you should just be just, oh, I just, oh. Like Peter says, when Jesus was in the boat with him, he said, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinner. John the Baptist, he says, I must decrease, he must increase. I am not even worthy to untie his, his sandal straps or something like that. Paul says, I make myself of nothing so the grace of God can abide on me. You guys have to empty yourself of yourself, of your thoughts, and fill it up with the word of God. Fill it up with Jesus, who is the word, and the word made itself flesh. You see, God is the great I am. Just for you guys who love theology, he's the great I am. The great I am. And that's kind of why I was going for this I am loved church. I am Jeremy. And if I was this dirt on the ground, I am dirt. Or if I was the trees, the trees would rejoice. I am tree. Whatever tree it is, oak tree. Or <laughs> I am grass. I am the ocean. God isn't these physical things because he's eternal. But he creates little I am's like him. I am Nikki. I am Joy. I am Lily. <clears throat> We are, we all have some sense of identity for the great I am, the, the ants. I am an ant. <clears throat> and the way God is, God gives to all these creatures and beings and celestial, the angels, he gives to them life. And he is so big and so glorious. Everything bows to his power because he is the power. He's the only power. There's only a power of light and the power of darkness. So the great I am creates wonderful, beautiful things. But I could not conceive or understand or reason how grand he is. And if I was like an ant, I could not rationalize what he's like. What? Like... Look it, you know? So he makes himself into an ant. And now I can talk, I can talk to another human being. Or an ant can talk to another ant. A dog can talk to another dog, and I believe so, right? And cats can talk to cats, and dolphins can talk to dolphins. The birds can talk to the birds. So there's languages. They're all languages. And they all talk to God. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing, right? I wasn't even expecting that one. We all talk to God. The birds, where do we find the food for today? Where do we travel? Where do we go? They always know where to go. Isn't that interesting? Even the ants, even, I mean, if you look around, look at creation, the way he's designed. They all know where to go, where to find their fruit, where to find and do things. That's just amazing, isn't it? And they all have their own language to him. And that's why God made himself in the form of Jesus. We couldn't understand God because he's too big. So he made himself into Jesus. So now we can talk to him. The Bible is, is, a, is a foundational thing. God is eternal. We read the book from the front to the beginning or in pages, certain pages or chapters, the chapters. But God is eternal. The Bible isn't for us to teach God as some of you may think or try to understand or reason him. He's beyond reason. The Bible isn't for us. Is it for God? It's for us. It's for who is for help us understand who he is. That's what it's for. I mean, I hear birds chirping every morning. He knows how to take care of the birds. He knows how to take care of the trees. The trees grow on time. You know, he knows when to make it snow. Surely if he can take care of these things, then he can definitely take care of us. The sun comes up every day. 
The stars and the moon, they don't fall out of line. So, that's basically all I got, got for you guys. Trust in the Lord. He's the Lord. I, I don't even know how to describe him. It's like if God, whom is Jesus, God made himself in the form of Jesus. He's all grace. He's not affected by anything that is evil. He's all light. There's no darkness in him. Jesus is our way to understand who God is like. But God is bigger than we will ever understand. Every time I read the Bible, I get something new. Wow, didn't see that. <laughs> and that's the way he wants us to live with him. He wants to surprise us and show us his beauty and how amazing he is and how unconditional and how loving he is. But it's hard in this world. We're always competing against each other. But deep down inside, we're all broken. And we need some healing and we need a savior. And Jesus wants to be your savior, your healer, your redeemer, your friend, your father, your mother, if you hadn't had one. He wants to be anything and everything that you hadn't have. He wants to fill every space up in your heart because there's some spaces and some doors in your heart that you've closed. You've closed them because you realize that I can't get it from this person or that. And now you're only living in one room and you think this is all life has for you. But I tell you, my, my God, our God, the only God, the one true God who lived in Jesus is greater than your sin. He's greater than those doors. He's greater than the opinions of this world and all the negativity that you will ever face. And he loves you and he died for you, for you, even if it was just for you, for you. He was on that cross crying and weeping, not for himself. He was on that cross crying and weeping for you. He was in pain and in agony, not because of how they brutalized him and stripped him bare and embarrassed him. That was you. That was your pain, your sorrow, your guilt. That's why he was up there. He was up there to take away all that. He wore that for you. You're wearing that right now. But he wore that for you and he wants to take it off of you because only he can carry it. But are you willing to trust him? By faith, I open my Bible every morning. By faith, I pray. By faith, I step out the door and go to work. And by faith, I love. I do everything by faith. And only through faith will God reveal himself. I thank you so much for watching. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. And that's what the title represents. You to say, I am loved. Until you believe it. And receive it. And let go. And live. Walk with Jesus every day. God bless.